Welcome to Not For Pieters. I'm John Dougal. Today's topic delves into the political and looks at our moral convictions. It's important for us to understand our own convictions as well as those of others who are within our circle of relationships. We live in a political world and uh, political differences can cause drama. And who wants that? We'll start off the discussion with an excerpt from Rudyard Kipling's poem, We and They. I love this poem. It's not a political poem, but it talks about the thinking of us and thems, we and they. Um, it's focused more on cultural differences and, and bigotry, but I think that uh, Kipling would be fine with us expanding that scope out a bit, at least in the theme, to, to include political differences. We won't go through the whole poem, but just the start is enough. Father and mother and me, sister and auntie say, all the people like us are we, and everyone else is they. Well, straight off the bat, Kipling is alighting tri tribalism with the behavior of little children. You know, little children would make a statement like that, father, mother, and me, since sister and auntie say, well, little children want to align their thoughts with those who they see as older, and they lack the ability to reason, and children like simplicity, you know, black and white thinking, we and they. And all of us can have that inclination, but it takes maturity to overcome it. So, uh, you know, our inclination is to hang out with the usins. That's what I call them, usins and thems, as opposed to we and they. Well, if you have a political inclination, you know how easy it is if somebody else is talking, talking politics and their politics aligns with yours and you know the discomfort you feel and the groan that, that is at the base of your heart, <laughs> you know, when you feel somebody's speaking otherwise, you know, somebody that would be in the they category. But at a high level of abstraction, you know, what is it fundamentally that makes the difference between we and they? Well, part of our discussion today comes from Jonathan Haidt's book, The Righteous Mind strongly recommend it. Haidt is an American social psychologist and author, and he's the Thomas Cooley Professor of Ethical Leadership at New York University Stern School of Business. His main areas of study are the psychology of morality and moral emotions. Well, the, the Righteous Mind discusses these moral differences, especially between liberals and conservatives, although it does include some discussion on libertarians. So what are these moral foundations? Well, the moral foundations of liberals, conservatives, and libertarians differ. And the moral foundations for height are harm, care, fairness, cheating, authority, subversion, in-group, which is also known as loyalty and betrayal, purity, which is also known as sanctity and degradation, and it's an ongoing study, and at the time that Haidt wrote the book, just started to scratch the surface of the moral foundations of libertarians and the foundation of liberty and oppression was added to, to start that initial distinguishment. Well, from the website, I'm just going to give some examples of this, but you know, care harm, that's the foundation related to our um, ability to feel um, the pain of others and it underlines virtues of kindness, gentleness, and nurturance. You know, when we get our dander up, an example would be the outrage over cruel treatment of another, such as a child being bullied or a coworker being racially abused. Um, we could extrapolate out a little further and look at the war in Ukraine, between Ukraine and Russia, and the war uh, between Hamas and Israel. And depending on who we think is the uh, perpetrator and the victim, you know, we'd also get a trigger of seeing, you know, harm there. Fairness cheating. Well, that foundation is, uh, pertains to a process of reciprocal altruism, and it identifies um, 
or it generates rather uh, ideas of justice, rights, and autonomy. So it's easy to come up with somebody being cheated. Uh, you know, just think of any kind of a fraud case where somebody like an old person, whatever, was cheated out of their life savings. Just, you know, they don't have their mental faculties and some unscrupulous person comes along and cons them out of all their money. Well, you know, that would certainly get the dander up. All right, authority and subversion. Um, that has underlying virtues of leadership and the importance of followership and includes deference to the legitimate authority and respect for that authority and for traditions. Um, in this moral pillar, you know, people that have score high on that, they'd have a love for police and a love for armed servicemen. And you could also even see if a near fanatical worship of a loved politician. All right, in-group, which is also known as loyalty betrayal. Well, that foundation, you know, um, has an underlying virtue of patriotism and self-sacrifice for the group. And it's active anytime people feel that it's a, you know, one for all and all for one. You know, when I was in elementary school, one of my teachers was so fond of saying, America, love it or leave it. And she'd have us say the Pledge of Allegiance every morning and we'd sing songs like America the Beautiful and My Country Tis of Thee. But when we were doing this, you could just see she was in her element. Purity, also known as sanctity and degradation. Well, that was shaped by a foundation of a psychology of disgust and contamination, and it has underlying religious notions um, to try to live in a more noble way. An example of distrust would be if something new or out of the norm, you know, new food and, you know, new medication. You know, I'm thinking of The Hobbit, you know, where Samwise says, I don't really hold for this elvish food, you know, or, I'm sorry, I don't hold for this, for foreign food, but this elvish food is not bad, you know. He was surprised he actually liked it. Well, you know, that's the kind of a thought that comes along. Uh, such a person would also have a... Uh, reservations when they meet a stranger from a foreign land that they're not familiar with. Okay, and then there's liberty oppression, and that foundation is about feelings of reactance and resentment, you know, that they feel towards anybody who dominates them and restricts their liberty. You know, such a person would hate over-regulation of absolutely everything, you know, like, I can't even lay tile in my house without getting a permit, you know, that kind of a thing. So there's also a hatred of, of uh, the power structures that, that come with bureaucracies. Well, this graph is from Height's book, and I took the screenshot from Wikipedia. You have liberals on the left, conservatives on the right, and moderates in the middle. Um, the far left highly values the moral foundations of harm, care, fairness, and cheating, but not so much the other moral foundations. On the far right, you have uh, a tendency to value all these moral foundations close to equally. So they still also value harm, care, and fairness, cheating, but to a lesser degree than do liberals. But, you know, the conservatives also value much higher than liberals authority, subversion, in-group, which is loyalty, betrayal, and purity, which is sanctity and degradation. And, of course, you know, moderates are in the middle. Libertarians are not on this chart, and in some ways they're a cross between liberals and conservatives, but in other ways they're kind of creatures of their own, because liberals, libertarians tend to hate uh, the government telling them what to do, and they so they have a motto, it's like, live and let live, so long as no one's messing with anyone else. And I went on to the Libertarian Party's uh, website, and they've got a new addition to their platform, which is our aim is to keep the Republicans out of the bedroom and the Democrats out of your pockets so that you can make your own choices and live life as you choose. Well, these proclivities, are they nature or nurture? In other words, were we born with these or did they develop over time? Well, on the moral foundations org website is a link to a, a TED talk where Heights speaking, and he refers to Gary Marcus, a brain scientist. And he says that the initial organization of the brain does not rely on uh, much on experience, 
nature provides the first draft, organized in advance of experience. Experience then revises and prioritizes the beliefs. So, yes, we're born with moral proclivities, but they can change a little bit as we, uh, as we learn. Uh, I like to just kind of refer for a moment to the Old Testament. So this would be a Judaic, uh, Judeo-Christian teaching. Uh, to Jeremiah, you know, one five, it says, "Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you." Well, the reason I bring that up is if God also uh, knew us before we were born, and some of us came out liberal, some of us came out libertarian, some of us came out um, as conservatives, we ought to keep a little bit of respect for one another in the sense that they were. Um, to a degree, born and created that way. Well, so in society, we've got liberals, libertarians, and conservatives. Um, there's also the apolitical, but I'm just going to kind of ignore that group. And just to add my thoughts to heights, um, I've overlaid a lifestyle of volitional critical thinking. And so you're going to have conservatives who use critical thinking, conservatives who don't, and likewise the same with liberals and libertarians. Um, and the reason I bring that up is, is that there's, from my own anecdotal experience, it's common to find professionals who every day use critical thinking as part of the vocation, but then when it comes to politics, they just abandon that and go with what they feel. You know, and on the flip side, of course, there are people who have no critical thinking skills at all. So, of course, they're not going to use it. Carl Jung said thinking, you know, or critical thinking is difficult. It takes a lot of effort. And that's why most people judge or just adhere to their pre-existing moral biases. And the people that exist to, you know, cling to their moral biases are kind of like Kipling's We and They. Um, and I would say, you know, it's the far more common result is that's what most people do. I'd go a step further and say, um, that the people, I'd call them ideologically possessed and they can't be reasoned with and reached by logic or truth if they have no uh, critical thinking ability. And that's kind of a hell of a condemnation, but I stand by it. Um, because anytime you try to argue with a person who, who doesn't value truth and reason over their feelings, all you're going to get is irritation and anger. It's a waste of time. So who are the people that are unreachable? On the left, I'd call such people mama bear narcissists. And on the right, I'd call them moray eel narcissists. And both a mama bear and a moray eel, they're going to basically get their dander up and attack uh, if they feel that their political beliefs are threatened. So let's kind of carry this analogy a little bit further. You know, a mama bear is designed to protect and demonstrate care for her cubs because that's what someone on the left cares about is, you know, is the care harm foundation, moral foundation. And so whether a threat is actually real or not, if she perceives a threat, she's going to attack. And you know the saying, never get between a mama bear and her cubs. Well, a mama bear is going to think of liberals as we and conservatives as they. And to her, conservatives are racist, Nazis, xenophobes, deplorables, you know those sorts of euphemisms. Okay, let's look at the southern border as an example. She's going to feel compassion for the immigrants, and America is a nation of immigrants she'd rationalize. So she sees immigration as the only salient issue and uh, people who want a better life. Therefore, anybody who wants a wall or something that inhibits that immigration is going to be you know, racist or xenophobic. All right. Now let's look at the moray eel narcissist. Well, a moray eel feels safe when he's surrounded within his underwater rock cave 
or the southern border wall. <laughs> you know, and anything enters in into its domain, the eel's going to feel threatened. The eel will think of as conservatives as we and liberals as they. So to the eel, liberals are commies, socialists, or libtards. Regarding immigration, the eel is okay with some controlled immigration because conservatives do value, you know, the care, harm, moral foundation, just not as much as liberals. So immigration can occur for the more eel, but only as long as there's well-defined parameters that will assure that the immigrants are a benefit to society and propose no safety risk. You know, therefore, to the more eel, a wall is absolutely essential. Well, mama bears and more eels share a few traits in common. Both value their feelings over truth and reason. Both judge and rationalize. And both, in my opinion, are morally arrogant, just in different ways. It's a, I'm right, you're wrong, it's so obvious, why can't you see it, kind of a mindset. Well, what would a critical thinker say about the southern, you know, wall or the border or border control? Well, the first thing that would probably come to mind is, because they know it's, a, it's, it's in the political arena, would be, you know, cui bono? Who benefits? Is there a financial benefit to anyone? Is there a political power benefit to, so, to, to the uh, politicians? As politicians, or, you know, that's job one. <laughs> uh, well, job one is, is to get reelected. You know, job two is to increase power. Well, and then who are the immigrants? You know, what countries do they come from? Are the people skilled and unskilled? You know, that'd be a question you'd ask. And then how many people are coming in? You know, hey, if it's one or two, who cares? If it's millions, well, maybe we ought to think about that, you know, and can we handle that many people, you know, and what are these people's, these immigrants' needs going to be, and what's the societal cost, and can we, can we really accept that many people without all kinds of problems, um, and then, you know, what else is coming in, fentanyl, criminal behavior, human trafficking, and then again, how much, so what's the societal impact of these things? critical thinker will think about these things and you could see the moral outrage on just raising the questions from both the conservatives and the liberals, you know, but this is sort of the difference between a critical thinker and someone who isn't or who doesn't use their critical thinking skills. All right, well, that raises the question, why do I even bring this up? This isn't a political channel, but you know, politics cause drama, or, or can, and that will impact your quality of life depending on where it falls into your various circles of friends. And it's a matter of how much energy do you want to expend. Um, you know, personally, I don't want to live with conflict in my innermost circle, and certainly not with a mama bear narcissist or a more eel narcissist. Because no fruit's going to come from it. No new information is going to arise. You know, nothing good is going to happen at all. So I wouldn't want it there. Um, that's on the innermost side. Well, you know, in the middle circle, okay, maybe you can let up a little bit. But, um, you know, you've got to look at it from the standpoint of saying, hey, these are pretty decent friends. And do I want politics to to put a damper on that. Now, you know, if the person has critical thinking skills and you look at it as an opportunity to, to broaden each other's minds, well then by all means, because then uh, you can have this discussion, there should be no hard feelings. Um, in the outermost circles, personally, I find it easier just to avoid politics altogether. Um, you know, I, it's like, uh, I'll use skiing as an example. I, I love to ski. And if somebody else can ski, then, hey, I'd be happy to ski with them. We can both enjoy the day. You know, but I'm not going to talk politics on the chairlift, you know, over lunch or, you know, certainly not, you know, uh, in the lodge or tavern afterwards over a beer. It just isn't worth it. So the point of this video is that we need to live deliberately and to live our best life. And that includes peace when it comes to our political beliefs. 
there's a time and a place for political discussions, and the point of this video is choose wisely. Well, if you like the video, please take a moment and hit the like button. It helps the algorithm to increase the channel's exposure. Um, I appreciate your viewership. Thanks for joining. Cheers.